Everybody knows the accelerated learning program, or many of you do. Talk about sort of when you think about uh, these questions, um, sort of how it is that you're, you dealt it. And when you think about placement and how you're related to the work you've done with ALP, how this kind of fits into your model. So uh, the, the ALP program is an, a, uh, a co-requisite model for developmental writing at the Community College Baltimore County. And you can see from the slide that's up there now that compared to our traditional model of you have to take a standalone developmental writing course and when you pass that, then you can, we let you into English 101. In the co-requisite model, they take the developmental course alongside English 101 and it just changes everything. And most importantly, it changes our success rate. It more than doubles it from 33% to 74%. One of the things that sort of bothered me over the years, as recently as last week, is uh, that a lot of people, last week, the Chronicle of Higher Ed had an article about our program. And they made this statement that people keep saying over and over that ALP works really well for students very close to the cutoff. And in case anybody in this room thinks that, I wanted to clarify, at our school, 65% of our students are placed in developmental writing. Of that 65%, 87% are eligible for ALP. If 87% is close to the cutoff, okay, the Chronicle had it right. But I think they were thinking of a much thinner slice. Um, and we, we actually did a little analysis of the, the students in the top 10 ACCUPLACER scores and the bottom 10, and we found that ALP had a more dramatic Im in, uh, impact on the success rates of those students down at the bottom of the scale than those at the top. So if we had a limited number of seats, uh, we would prefer to give ALP to the students who are further away from, according to ACCUPLACER, of being ready. So I, 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 th I thought the diagram uh, Bruce showed a minute ago showing all but 10% of the students going directly into credit English, but a big chunk of them with support, sounds just about right based on our experience and our data. And Tristan, same experience at Austin P. Yeah, very similar kind of experience. There at Austin P, the, the, the general demographics, about two thirds of the students come in with some, uh, some low subscore, uh, below 18. <laughs> our admissions criteria means that we don't actually accept students who have an ACT subscore of below 13. Uh, but anywhere in between there, those students are going into this credit bearing class right from the very beginning and are, uh, as you see, succeeding in that um, credit bearing class at much, much higher rates in a single semester than they ever did in the sort of slow death of several semesters that they had before. Uh, and it's well worth, I think it's also well worth mentioning that in the, in the English, uh, so this is freshman writing, it's not the only class that people have to take. Of course, they carry on into English, te in English 1020 and into uh, uh, third semester uh, English literature classes, and we've been able to track those students into those classes too and see that they, they actually succeed at much higher rates than they did before. So it isn't the case that we're sort of giving them a free pass. We're actually preparing them much more thoroughly than we ever did before. Um, for, uh, as I say, we, don't, we didn't admit students who were below 13, but we created a, a program uh, which actually was specifically focused at military students. We have a very large military base close to Austin P. And so we created a program that was focused at students who had come back from Afghanistan, Iraq, and had really been thinking about, they hadn't been thinking about taking classes for a while and their, their skills were rusty and so they would take a, you know, their AccuPlacer or their, uh, or their Compass test would get low scores. And so we created a sort of a structured lab environment where they would work uh, at their own pace to get themselves to a place where we could admit them. And so in a space of about a month, they were able to take their ACT scores that were much lower, you know, scores that were below, uh, below that 13 cutoff, get themselves to a place where now their math and reading and writing skills were now sort of broadly speaking in the low teens. And now we know that now this, this, this co-requisite kind of model works perfectly fine for those students. And so we've admitted those students and they are, uh, they, they actually show, have shown a significant amount of success. So that's, that's at least one, one facet of the way in which we've dealt with the, the, the students to the far left. We have Kira Brox here who's a student at Ivy Tech Community College. 
And Kira, a few years ago, you entered Ivy Tech, and you had to take a placement exam. And Correct. you had an experience that you have something to share about. Why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit more Correct. about your experience? Um, about four years ago, actually, when this program first started, um, I had taken a placement test there at Ivy Tech. And um, I was one of those people that I aced English. I was really good with English. I am really good with English. Um, but math, uh, I only missed the, the cutoff point by two points. So with that, um, of course, as we see with the old model, that I was forced to take a remediation class, which didn't challenge me. Um, it wasn't that I was so far behind that, you know, that math class is going to be, um, you know, like a... a, a life changer. Yeah, a life changer for me. But at the same time, it was like I, I had to take a whole semester of this course right. that um, didn't go towards my college credit. So... Um, it wasn't only money wasted, but I felt for me it was time wasted, and it kind of it kind of uh, put me behind a little bit. You know, I felt that oh well, if I have to keep taking these remediation classes and stuff like that, that it um, it, it just doesn't give you the motivation to continue forward. And like you said before, the um, graduation rate on people who have to take these remedi remediation classes um, is not very high due to that. So, if they had something like this for math, I would have definitely. Uh, been probably graduated by now. So you know yeah. Ivy Tech, of course, is moving into a co-requisite model. We're going to learn more about that in a few minutes here. So when you think about the students that you were with at Ivy Tech and the opportunity that they might have to be able to jump right into a college-level course and get some additional support, I mean, do you, what's your sense of the students that you, that you go to school with? Would this be an experience that they would jump at? Do you think that's something that, that, that would work for them? Yes, I believe it would have given a lot more students a lot more confidence to continue, you know, to jump right into college and um, also the sense that the facility that they're going to also is giving them that support. Instead of just saying, oh, well, you know, you're not college ready yet. We're going to put you back here for a while and then move you forward. I think um, having something, a model like this, would give them the confidence to continue forward. Right. So, Peter, talk more about sort of the weight and the power that these placement exams have on your campus and when you were around and in terms of how that impacts the ability to move a model like ALP and what, why we need to think differently about placement exams if we're going to really push the needle it's, around this. It's just amazing how easy it is for anyone who deals with this environment, myself included, to look at an AccuPlacer score, and there's a clear number, 56. That person belongs in our lower level developmental writing class, as if that number really captured, and, and, and it doesn't. And it's about, Tom Bailey mentioned this morning that students close to the various cutoff scores and the ones just below and just above are hardly measurably different, and yet we treat them as if they're completely different animals, that they one goes into the credit course, one goes into the developmental course. So one of the ideas that we've been toying with, and I think this would have worked for Kira perfectly, is let, let's, let's assume if, if we could do an elaborate about evaluation of students and let them take Angela Duckworth's grit scale and let them take a, write, a, write an essay for their English teachers. If we had time to do that for everybody, it would be great. But given the time and the cost of doing that for thousands of students, let's look more closely at those students close to those cutoffs. And what, one possibility is to say to those students, honestly, you, you're, you're right on the borderline, either above or below the cutoff, and here's your options. If you choose to, you can go into the credit course, but you ought to know you're going to need to work a little harder. If you choose uh, to take the developmental course, it's a safer route, but it'll cost you a semester, and it will help address those problems of, of resentment for being forced into that developmental course. We, if we don't have the time to do that kind of, we call it directed self-placement for every student, we could at least do it for the students on either side of the cutoff. And I think the students, as Tom said this morning, the students would... would probably do a better job of deciding which side of the line they're on than the test does. One of the things I'm beginning to observe in some of the states is that they're committed to doing co-requisite, they're committed to doing multiple measures in terms of assessments, but even in doing so, they're cutting it really fine yeah. and to the point where co-requisite is just, they, they, the slice of students that are actually will be eligible for the co-requisite is very, very small, kind of like you said, Peter. Yeah. And so this whole notion of, on one hand, you have the power of these assessments that still sort of take people's minds out, even though they're committed to say, yeah, co-requisite makes sense. So 
Uh, Tristan, talk more about sort of, as you think about, where is the future around placement exams and assessment? And, and when you think about all these measures, what's a more appropriate way to think about it that's going to allow these types of strategies to take root and scale? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the most sobering thing is, and, and Tom talked a, a little bit about this earlier, is, is this idea of the fact that a sequence of classes really makes such an enormous difference to the likelihood of success. So, you know, 70% of 70% really is 49%. And so having two classes, even with success rates of 70% as a pipeline, is still inferior to a situation where the students went straight into that class and had a 50-50 chance. And so to, to not recognize the fact that when you make these kinds of placements, that you don't make just a, a little bit of a difference to, their like, to a student's likelihood of success, but a very dramatic difference, that's the thing which is very sobering. So, you know, the kinds of ideas that, that at least we have been toying with are to take all of these pieces, to take, uh, you know, as you say, so some kind of ACT placement score, uh, some kind of assessment of high school, high school transcript, high school GPA. I mean, it is sort of remarkable to imagine that we can take an entirety of high school experience and sum it up with an integer between 12 and 36. That, that, that does seem sort of odd. Mm -hmm. um, and then to, to recognize, you know, to use some kind of non-cognitive kind of, kind of measure, be that the grit. I think we, we don't know that we understand the grit score well enough to really know how much utility that might have over a broad population, but we're beginning to. And then I think to, to discipline ourselves to say, okay, now we have three numbers there will be a tendency to say, well, we know how to do this. We'll do multilinear regression <laughs> instead of single regression, and we'll come up with another cut score. That's, that's not the way. Instead, instead, we should, uh, ins instead, we should take those scores and create a choice architecture that empowers the students to be able to rake the right kinds of choices for themselves. And that may be a restricted choice. It may be that you know, if you come out good in all three measures, well, then you should go take the credit-bearing class. Just go, go ahead and do it. And if you come out with two of those measures in good shape, yeah, you're probably good to go ahead and create the credit-bearing class. If you come out and you have one of those measures, yeah, well, then, then maybe there's a choice between mm -hmm. going straight into that credit-bearing class with a significant amount of support, yeah, and maybe taking a more measured approach and it taking longer. But if you come out with all three of those measures in a low, yeah, that's probably not a good plan to go into the credit-bearing class, and we can say so with a good deal of certainty, and so instead having a much more structured kind of remediation that really recognizes where the curricular deficits that you have are and make sure we get you good on, on a good footing, that makes sense. But I think something like that makes an awful lot more sense than to, to just fall back into the same track that we did before and create some multilinear regression model. So, Kira, let's say that you took some of these assessments and you got it back to, they, we brought it back to you and it said, well, we know that you have some strengths in these areas, but here's some areas both in terms of some of your, you know, your academic skills, but some of your sort of other skills as well that you need to be successful and said, lay that in front of you and said, we want to put you in a gateway course, but we know we have to construct an experience that's going to work on all these things. And we're going to help you through that. I mean, think about what would that have meant to you instead of just saying you should go over, we're telling you to go over here? It, it would have meant a lot more because um, I actually had a, a conversation with another fellow student of mine not right before I came here, and I agree with you that um, if we had something like that, that ultimately I feel that the student knows innately what their, their strengths and their weaknesses are. And um, these tests, because I knew when I missed it by two points, I'm like, I have to take this whole remediation class. And I know that it's not, it's, it's not going to be something for me that is, is going to be helpful. Um, so with that, I think something like this would be perfect. Um, that kind of shows them where they're at, and that gives them the option to say, hey, are you confident enough to go into this gateway course or this, you know, like you said, on all three levels? Um, to just take the, the regular course, or do you feel that you're in remediation, or if the, sc the scores are so low that um, they need to do some type of remediation? Great, thanks. Why don't we open it up for some questions? Are there any questions from the audience about uh, this topic around assessment placement? Hard to see from here. Go ahead, from West Virginia, I think it is. Hi, I'm Sarah Tucker from West Virginia. Peter, this question is for you. You talked about 87% um, of the students who qualify for remediation are eligible for the ALP program. 
I'm wondering about the 13% that aren't. Who are they? How are you identifying them? And what are they doing if they're not doing ALP? That was for me. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm so glad you asked that because I think that's one of the big pieces of unfinished business. I think as uh, higher education has not figured out what to do with those students. And, and uh, iBEST is a, is a very promising solution. Um, a lot of schools are now creating something they refer to as a floor and telling that group of students um, to go someplace else to adult basic ed and, and work on their skills and then we'll give them a chance to try to, so, and I, I don't think that's a good idea. At my school, we have a lower level course that they, uh, that they take and it's not very successful, less than, fewer than 20% of the students who are placed in that course ever pass uh, first year composition. Um, if, if now, now I'm gonna represent only my own opinion, but once we got a look at that data that showed that ALP worked, was, had a more significant impact on students at the low end of the range of scores, I, I became convinced we should just let everybody into ALP. And every student who needs developmental education should take it in the co-requisite model. So for, for, for me at my school, I would at least be willing to pilot that because I think we might find a lot better than that under 20% success rate. But I think it's a, an area we have not yet come to, to, an, to answers for. That lower group of students, um, too, too often we're too quick to give up on them. Kristen, I know that you have students that uh, don't hit the cut score or the, hit the ACT score to get admitted to your institution. Mm -hmm. But if they do, you provide some kind of support and opportunity for them to be able to get ready for the, the, the college level. Can you talk more about that? Is like tutoring and that kind of experience or like test prep opportunities for students? Yeah, we do. I mean, and that's just in many ways a sort of a, um, a broadening of the, the program I alluded to before. I mean, I think it's one of these things that we don't focus on very much. The, so think about ACT, you know, ACT scores are some number between 12 and 36. So how much effort does it take to, like how much time, how much commitment does it take to make, to move a student's ACT score from 12 to 16? Is it the same amount of time and effort that it takes to move them from 26 to 30? It's four, right? It's just four points. So. It, we sort of convince ourselves that somehow these numbers have some kind of, you know, even linear basis to them, whereas this really is not actually the case at all. That you know, within a matter of weeks, I mean, you, you talked quite, you talked about this, that probably to, to change the two points that would have put you into that credit bearing class, you know, we probably could have sat down in an afternoon and you could have taken the class right, again. Right. And done it, right? <laughs> Or, but, but we don't do that. We don't sit down and say, okay, so let's see if we can find that and let's see how quickly we can make that change. Instead, we say, well, we, have a, we know how we do this. We've got that course over there that's supposed to take care of that. And I think that it's that recognition. It's trying to figure out those kinds of ways, uh, which, which is a, a big piece. I mean, in Tennessee, they, there's been some significant work in recognizing that in, in, in this remediation that there are a number of competencies that need to be addressed, that need to be recognized, that students can work towards, and that that too can happen. You know, it may well be that a student doesn't need to take an entire semester's of work to get themselves back to a place where they can, see, can succeed in the credit bearing class. And maybe, you know, maybe something that can be addressed in a week. We have time for maybe one more question. Is there one from the audience here? Yeah, over, oh, there. over here in Louisiana, Nathan. I wanted to uh, wanted to pose a question actually from more the uh, the policy and the implementation uh, process. Tristan, you've gone from uh, from a university up to the system level. Now, if if a university wanted to replicate what you've done, mm -hmm. if a system wanted to replicate what's what's going on there, talk a little bit about the inherent costs. What 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 uh, what is a university if they want to do what you've done? What are they signing up for? In terms oh, that's of a great question. All right, so the way in which it functionally works at Austin P is that students enroll straight into that credit bearing class and they pay a $75 lab fee. And that $75 lab fee then basically means that we can run the supplementary instruction at cost. That, that $75 fee really, really basically pays for that. So the, the way in which people think is to say, well, look, 
we have a significant number of students who are going off and taking these developmental classes. They won't be in those classes anymore. Uh, and so isn't there going to be a significant change in revenue? And so I'd like to, for a moment, argue that the answer is no, that actually it's the other direction. And so, so let me explain why that is. It's because what we do is in our minds, we equate the credit bearing class with the credit bearing class and then everything from there on out. And then there is this class over here, this developmental class, which is no longer part of the picture. And then we say, well, we used to get three hours of credit for that. And so or three hours of tuition for that that just disappeared. But that's not the right picture. And it's not the right picture because those students, having taken that class, so few of them actually enrolled in a credit-bearing class anyway, and after that, so few of them carry on to the rest of their degree, <coughs> but that's not the right alignment. Instead, you should think to yourself, the credit-bearing class that those students are in when they walk in the door is, at least for our discussion right now, for funding's sake, equivalent to the developmental class that they were once in. So in the first semester of study, revenue is neutral, right? They were in whatever credit hours they were in, paying to whatever tuition that they would always be paying. That revenue is neutral. It's just they're in a different class. Now let's turn the clock forward to semester two. When you turn the clock forward to semester two, those students who began in the developmental class, many of them are no longer even enrolled in the institution anymore. They've gone. They failed out, they dropped out, they faded out. But in this co-requisite model, now 70% of those students passed college or passed that credit-bearing math class the first time, they're still going. Now there they are in semester two taking classes, there they are in semester three and beyond. And so actually, it, the revenue picture for institutions that introduce this co-requisite model, the revenue picture is positive, not negative. Does that make any sense? I add a little bit? Yeah, that's been your experience as well, right, Peter? Yeah. Y yes. Um, we, our experience is if you measure the cost in cost per successful student, even though our class sizes in ALP are half what they are in the traditional program, it's, a, it's less expensive to the, universe, to the, to the college. But I wanted to, Tristan, I thought, did a great job of covering the dollars and cents kinds of costs. I wanted to talk for just a second about the other kinds of costs that you would be buying into at a system or at a university. I've worked ne next door to you all in Arkansas. I've worked in Indiana and Connecticut recently and did a lot of work in Colorado and West Virginia. And I've watched systems and I've watched schools struggle with that question. And I just would like to add that there are a lot, it's, it's a, lot, it's a lot bigger, more complicated ship that we're trying to change course on okay. than certainly I realized in the beginning. And, and the kinds of things, it's easy to start a pilot, and, and, and Stan points out that that's the easy part, but, but scaling up is the hard part. And when you start scaling up, you run into problems with classroom space. We had an immense need for faculty development because this is a brand new course no one had ever taught before. We Trying to get the advisors on board to understand the program, trying to get enough computers to support the program, trying to, get, trying to change the whole prerequisite system because we've changed the developmental courses. So all of our prerequisites in, for every course it, it, it's just been hours and hours of meetings and negotiations and winning over skeptical administrators and faculty. Um, I, I'd like to think that the, the biggest problem is not resistance from anybody. It's nobody digging their heels in and saying, I don't want to improve education for these students. It's inertia. It's just the system is so big that if you don't, right from the beginning, start thinking about how to scale it up so that it, it's going to going to affect everyone, uh, every one of those students, it, it, it's a hard task to do, and that's an, a, a cost in administrative time and effort and sometimes people's nerves and patience. Mm -hmm. yeah, very Great, common. thanks, Peter. Just sort of wrap up this session before we move on to the next one. I think, uh, just to sort of conclude, and the slide's not coming up, but I'll just sort of, sort of capture it. Basically, at the end of the day, what we're talking about then is it's all this time around multiple measures and looking at assessment, it really shouldn't be about building the perfect test again. It should be about uh, 
finding the right way to serve students, gathering this information and serving them more effectively in gateway courses, eliminating all the barriers that you've built in the system, and provide that support in a co-requisite manner. And if we think we can do that, you can begin to see some of the results that Peter and Tristan and many others are beginning to achieve using this model. So let's thank this panel. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you.